Yeah. Sweet. Share screen. Desktop three. Sweet. All right. Well, welcome to the third installment of how to create a church audio live stream template. Uh, so we just went through system processing. That's what I like to say is like mixing. Um, when you do live mixes, you're definitely going to use all of these faders. Um, the best way to mix at the beginning is to go into these VCAs and do it channel by channel until you have your desired sound. And then you go into your effects. I like to keep all of these, um, all of these at uh, negative infinity. This means that they're not on. So once you get like the dry sound sounding really, really good, you boost these as you want for desired effect. And then these are your volumes for all of the channels. So it's kind of like a, um, basically it's a group fader. Like if, if the instruments are too hot, um, put the instrument bus down. If the vocals are too low, you boost them. Um, the best way to get gain is not to boost the fader. The best way to get gain is through a compressor. That way it's regulated. It's a regulated compressor. Think of like the, um, like the, how the SEC regulates the, uh, the stock market. If the stock market didn't have any regulation, it'd be crazy. So the SEC is just there to make sure that it doesn't go crazy. So after this, after you, finalize all of your mixing and what you want it to sound like. The next thing is to go into your stereo out, which goes into your master. Um, this is where we get our, our, basically it's the main stereo out. So all of these channels feed into the stereo out, stereo out which then feeds into the live stream mix through the board. Then it goes through the board, which is our Behringer wing goes through the board to the video console, which is called an ATEM. And then it goes to the, from the ATEM to YouTube. And so it's a very, very, it, it sounds complicated. When you follow it, it's really not. Um, I promise there's a lot of cutoffs and there's a lot of uh, different paths that um, all this audio takes. But when you're following the main path, it is, it's very, very um, straightforward. So for the stereo out, the first thing I want to do is add a S1 imager. This is called a stereo imager. Just um, let me find it for you. S1 imager. The plugin looks like this. Um, for a worship service, you want this. Oh, you do not want it to be asymmetric. Asymmetric basically means how much you're pushing left and how much you're pushing right. You want to keep that at zero just because you want it to come out from the middle. Um, for this is what you want to pay attention to is the width right here. Uh, the width is how big of a stereo image you want. I usually go around 1.15. Uh, that way it kind of boosts the stereo quality a little bit. It makes it more wide and it makes it more atmospheric. And that's what you kind of want to get when it goes into the slow parts of worship, when there's no singing and no um, kind of drums. You, you just get guitar swells and the vocals just kind of harmonizing. I really want it to have a very like broad stereo image. So that's the first thing. Second thing is gonna be your harmonic maximizer. So a maximizer is basically just a limiter, uh, but it, it does a little more than that. So let me find my harmonic maximizer. Multi-maximizer. Where would that be under? I thought it was by waves. Was it L3 multi maximizer? 
Why not? Why not? Oh, that is ugly. That is not, let's not do that. It might be by isotope. No. Oh, found it. Okay. It is, what was it? This is BBE sound. Um, so a harmonic maximizer is basically, it takes three or four bands of audio. Let's say, just like the SSL, it takes the low frequencies, the low mid, the high mid, and the high frequencies. And then basically, you can tune it and then makes it, um, since it's a harmonic maximizer, that means it has saturation to it, which is very analog. Um, or saturation basically just means it adds harmonic content or frequencies on an even level throughout the higher frequencies, which basically makes it, there's more color and more grit to it. It makes it sound more professional. You don't want to boost this too much. You just want it to have a little bit of some color. So I usually put this around 80. That's where our base is and our low mix. I you can boost this however much you want or need for your mastering. I usually put it at around 2.5. High tune. High tune, I usually put around 3,000 with the mix, like probably 1.5 to 2.5. I'm going to put two right here. And then this output, you can, you can gain it as much as you need. I highly suggest you don't gain it over three decibels because then it gets very, very muddy, very fast. So that is the second one. Third one is the Sonic Maximizer, which I think is actually in DBE2. Yep. This is basically the same thing, but it's uh, Sonic Maximizing, just how to explain that. It's basically shaping the frequencies. Um, it's making sure that you have kind of like a runoff on the low end and a runoff on the high end. It kind of looks like a hill, so to say. So the contour, you kind of want it to be around, I like it around two process. I like it around three. And then the set, um, I would say about 800 is your, like 700 to 800 is your sweet spot. This basically just gives a nice rolling runoff. Very, 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 um, how do I state it? Very non-steep slope to the frequencies. Best way to explain that is if I take this runoff right here and I make it look like this, the sonic maximizer basically does this, but up here and it's like a quarter of this. So it almost looks like this, if that makes sense. I'll get rid of that because that is no point now. No plug in, sweet. So that's the Sonic Maximizer. Then we have the Pugue Tech EQ P1A, which I'm gonna guess is in waves. Two tech looks like this. This is basically a program equalizer. Uh, how would you explain this? This is basically like where you want your main frequencies to pop, if that makes sense. This is gonna be your Q factor or how sharp or how small, or how sharp or how large you want your curve. This is your boost, which means how much you want to boost it. Attention is, I guess, what is attention? Is it attention or attenuation? Maybe it's attenuation. So <coughs> attenuation is how much it affects. Yes. Yeah. So attenuation is basically your dry wet level of the boost. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's what I thought it was. So for boost, you don't want to go over three. I want my CPS to be around 
you can do either 60 or 100. I want it to be around 100. Attenuation, put around two. I put it, my bandwidth around three. Um, for high frequency, I want it around five because that's where you're talking most of the time. Just give it a little attenuation, probably around one, boost it around two. Attenuation select, I'm going to say 10, mm, let's do 10,000 kilohertz. And then for mains, put it at 50. And then this is where you can even add more gain to the overall mix. I wouldn't go above three. I would put it around 1.5 just to give it a, some color from the Pube Tech. Um, second is an NLS channel. Which I gotta find it. I just found it. Looks like this. This is basically another compressor to just kind of glue everything together. Um, this is kind of, how do I explain this? You have Spike Mic and Nervo or Nevo. It's just different sounding compressors from the 1800, or not 1800, from the 1980s or 1990s. Um, you can use the, v the VCA group. I wouldn't, I just, this is where you get even more gain for the, um, master but each of these different channels has a different gain algorithm which basically means the gain is going to sound different from each of these um i prefer mic uh, just because it's a warmer color to the it it adds to the low mids rather than adding too much to the highs or too much to the lows so just be very, very careful with the drive and the output. You want to add gain to the stereo out in very little increments. So that's the best way to do that. Um, what is this? One, two, three, four, sixthly, or for the sixth one, we're going to add the L2. L2 ultra maximizer. The L2 is basically a limiter in all of its aspects. A limiter, is, like I said before, is when, let's say the threshold is at negative seven, if the max or the stereo out sound goes above negative seven, then the uh, limiter is going to catch it and then it's going to push it through the attenuator and make sure it is not going above zero. So you don't want the out ceiling to be zero because then it's gonna go, it's basically maximizing really, really hard, maximizing any sound from negative seven dB to zero dB. So what I usually do is I put this around 3.5 to four and I put the out ceiling to around one, negative one. And the reason why, is because you don't want the out ceiling to be zero because then it could push over zero if there's just so much um, frequency or so much, I guess, volume going into the out ceiling. So you definitely want it to be below zero. The release, I like it to be, I like it to be up a little bit, probably around 2.5. This is in milliseconds. Um, and then, that's kind of what you want to do with this. You want the 24 bits. That's basically going to make it the most um, clear on a digital platform. For Dither, I like type one and for shaping, I like normal. That is that. And then to make sure that you're doing everything right, I use a WLM meter a wavelength meter i don't know <coughs> oh yeah for yeah that's what i was gonna go into meter meter. oh i guess yeah so there's two different types there's two different groups of how you read volume and you can go into these groups there's more subgroups that you can go into but right now we're focusing on decibels and luffs. So when you look at this, 
meter right next to the stereo out, this is going to be your sound in decibels. You don't want the decibels going over zero, like I said, or else you'll get clipping or digital artifacts. But there's also another way to know how much volume is getting pushed out through LUFs. And LUFs is very important because this is how the streaming platforms such as Spotify or Apple Music or even YouTube, as we're <coughs> focusing on today, this is how they do their compression algorithm. So basically what I mean by that is, let's say you're running around, let's say three dB, negative three dBs, but you're pushing a negative six LUFs, it's going to, what's going to happen is YouTube is going to take it, push it through their compression algorithm and basically crunch it. Like I said, it's clipping, basically crunch it together to where it all sounds very, very flat because they're basically shaving out all of the, all of the leveling from their threshold to the out ceiling. And they, they just literally cut it off and then boost it. It's very, very bad. So how to get by this is that every streaming service has a, has a, what, what would you call it? A preferred, I would say a preferred luff, luffs reading around negative 14. You can go up to negative 10, but I highly don't recommend it. Um, I usually keep it to about negative 16 to negative 12. That way there's no clipping or digital artifacts when it goes into YouTube. Um, that's what LUFS is. So let's say I have all of this going. Um, let's say I have it at negative three and I'm only hitting negative 18 LUFS. What I want to do is make sure that there's compression going on. So I don't want the stereo out to go above zero, but the compression in certain areas isn't working hard enough to keep it full bodied in the low areas of the volume. And it's not catching the transients basically. So the transients or the hard attack waves push the dbs above zero so that's what that's one reason why you're putting on compressors but the other reason why you're putting on compressors is because you want the low volume of all these sounds to be brought up to be heard within the mix and then that is what makes your dbs level and therefore makes your luffs uh Persistent, I guess is the best word. Consistent, yes. Um, so once your luffs are kind of consistent, you want to play around with the stereo, or you want to play around first with these, with these buses, just to make sure that you are getting a good sound. And then if you go over, it is okay to take the master and drop it back, but it's not okay to take the master and push it forward above zero, because then it's going to get very crunchy. So once you get a good area of negative 16 to negative 12, it is ready to be shipped off to YouTube. Now, it is important to notice or know that YouTube basically takes your volume and compresses it negative 6 dB, which basically mean, means it'll take whatever sound you're running and minus 60 B off of it, which is basically taking this master and going down negative 60 B, right? So the best way to counteract this is to have a consistent number of watts and to get these compressors to bring out the small little details of each sound. That way, that way the volume, once it's crushed, will be very, very full bodied, very energetic. Yeah, but other than that, I mean, that is how you do um, mastering on a track. What's very, very common is people go into live stream templates and think that they have to 
master like a complete professional audio engineer that's been doing this for 20 years at a studio that costs three hundred thousand dollars a lot of times churches don't have three hundred dollars three hundred thousand dollars to do a live stream studio so what you have to do is you have to get by with what sounds good what will make you pass on youtube and what makes you sound professional the whole reason to do this and doing these mixes and these mastering techniques is to make you sound professional. When you get this in depth on mixing and mastering, especially in a live stream sense, most normal people don't know the difference between, they know the difference between a good mix and a bad mix, of course, because in a bad mix, you're gonna get clipping and digital artifacts and your drums aren't gonna sound good. They're gonna sound all over the place. The instruments are going to sound all over the place. The vocals are absolutely untamed. What I'm trying to say is by doing this, it gives your live stream a very, very concise picture in audio. And it makes you guys sound very, very professional. So that is kind of what you're doing through the mixing and through the mastering. Um, yeah, that's basically it. That's, I think I covered everything. Do you guys have any questions in the back? It's good? Okay, sweet. All right. Stamp of approval. Stamp of approval.